Well done. And we are now talking asset allocation. And asset allocation is about making the right choices at the right time. But, of course, the question of how much to commit and for what term of time is getting more and more complicated as the world keeps throwing us surprise after surprise. Fortunately, our next panel coming up are expert investors who are going to be able to give us uh, a really a tremendous perspective on how they balance their portfolios from the near term to the medium term to the long term. They are going to be ably led today by Harshka Patel, who is the CEO of Asia Private Bank and the CEO of Hong Kong for JP Morgan. You can rally your troops and make your way to the stage. Following her is going to be, here they come. Yes, let's give them a round of applause to get them up here. <laughs> Following Harshika, we welcome Howard Marks, who is the co-chairman of Oak Tree. We have Ming Mei, who is the co-founder and CEO at GLP. Michael Sachs is the chairman and CEO joining us all the way from GCM Grosvenor. And of course, we have George Walker, who is the chairman and CEO at Newberger Berman. And with that, Harshka, are you ready for action? I certainly am. Take it away. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. It's wonderful to be here today. And I have to say, I am superbly privileged to be sitting next to and sharing the stage with some of the greatest minds in the, uh, in the asset management industry. I think between their organizations, they run almost a trillion dollars, uh, US dollars of uh, AUM. And gentlemen, don't get offended by my next comment, but between them, they've chalked up almost 150 years in the uh, asset management industry. So I really am looking for, they're staring at me now, or oh, my career's not going very well. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, their insights, how they've made it, and, uh, and what's to come. Um, but gentlemen, before we launch into the questions, I promised you an icebreaker. Um, I didn't tell them what the icebreaker was, because I think it's very important that we all understand how, how they think before we get into the topic of uh, asset allocation. So gentlemen, we're on a deserted island. There's one tree, and there's one banana at the top of the tree. And there's four animals who are competing to see who can get to that banana first. A lion, a giraffe, a squirrel, and a monkey. By the way, audience, feel free to play along. Who gets to the top first? So there's no right or wrong answer. So George? Um, I would say the monkey because the uh, both ability to climb and it's their natural food source. So Thank I'm, you. I'm long the monkey. Okay. Michael. Can, can, I, can I go last? <laughs> You're so I'll, I'll give my answer a competitive now, but bunch. I, I, I think I would go with George on the monkey, but I think the lion ends up with the food. Okay. Ming? I always do the easy one. I just reach up as a giraffe. Giraffe. And Howard, last but not least. I would say whoever uses the most leverage. <laughs> Remember, you're sedated right now, so, uh, so who would you go with? I think the monkey. The monkey. Okay, so ladies and gents, the monkey means we have a lot of deep thinkers on this panel. And uh, uh, Michael, you mentioned the lion, which means you've got the fighting spirit. Um, and Ming, you mentioned the giraffe, so very logical. So a very diverse panel, logical, deep thinkers with the fighting spirit. So, um, so with that, I'm going to start off with my, my first quick question. Clearly, all of you have had an extremely successful career in the asset management industry. Howard, starting with you, when did you realize you were good at this stuff? Uh, and what was your differentiator? Because clearly back then, it was not the era of cheap money. Well, I would say, uh, you know, I started to, uh, I moved from equity research after 10 years. In, in 1978, I started up Citibank's high yield bond. Operation. So after a half dozen years uh, of results, I think I, I, I concluded I was okay. Um, and, and, what, and what was your edge, do you think? Edge? Yeah. Um, I think I understood that, well, I, I had adapted the policy that in fixed income, especially, you win by not losing. Uh, and so. Uh, you know, we, we now have a motto at Oak Tree that if we avoid the losers, the winners take care of themselves. And that was roughly the period when I developed that approach, and, and I think it has worked. And would that be your advice today, start for someone starting out? 
Well, it, that's great in fixed income. It's if, if you aspire, if you have uh, strategies that aspire to higher returns uh, than fixed income returns, then you have to uh, move out in pursuit of winners. It's not a, sufficient to avoid losers, and and uh, so you have to you you should use a, a strategy or approach which is uh, right for your asset class. But for ours, it it has been great. Thanks, Howard. Ming. You know, I came from a pretty humble background, so I, ever since I was a kid, I, I was very focused on, focused on making money. <laughs> and uh, my goal in life was pretty simple. I just want to go and look and not worry about the price on the menu. Um, but I think the turning point for me was um, when I realized that, that I'm not good at everything, and there are many people that are much better than me. And realizing it and accepting it was a turning point for me. And that's when I start learning how to leverage people and scale the business. I would say another um, lesson I learned is that it's much better to focus on one or two things for 20 years instead of focusing on one or two things every two years. And because no matter how stupid I am, the knowledge and experience that accumulated, that you become intrinsic and the risk you can identify without even thinking. So that's, these are the two things that if I start all over again, I wish I can do it earlier. So, Ming, out of interest, what weren't you good at? Actually, um, I'm, I don't make good decisions under stress. So that's why I leave the execution to others. I thinking more long-term that had no accountability. <laughs> sage, sage advice. Michael. So I, I, I worked my whole life from the time I was a little kid with a paper route. And I had many, many, many jobs uh, all the way, you know, until I began a professional career. And a number of those jobs uh, were jobs where very clearly the sort of the harder you worked, the better you did. And that was an important lesson for me. And I think that the differentiator for me was maybe a bit the, the, the culture and the frame and the values that we've operated the business with since the early 1990s, but work ethic. Where that came from professionally in the asset management world was being exposed to people early on who were clearly smarter than I was. So I remember distinctly meeting some fixed income arbitrage folks in the early 90s. Uh, they were math Olympians. They had three or four math Olympians at this little firm in a strip mall in New Jersey. I don't think I knew there was a math Olympics. Okay, and I just distinctly remember coming out of this meeting and saying, well, these people are much smarter than I am, but I can work hard enough to be successful, and I can lead a good business that gives good value and does a good job for our teammates and for our clients, and I'll be able to succeed uh, by doing that. When I knew I could do that, I think we always learn more from periods of stress and loss, and so going through 94, 98, 08, you gain a confidence in your ability to do a good job for your clients, uh, you gain a confidence in the resiliency of your business. And uh, that, that's, th those were the periods for me when I got more confident in our, yeah, our ability to just keep doing a good job. So Michael, I did a paper round when I was eight, which was many years one, ago. One of, and my, I remember, one of my jobs. Well, can you remember how much you earned? Because I, I earned three pounds seventy-five for five hundred papers. I do not remember how much I earned. It was nothing. I mean, it was like this was a probably late nineteen sixties, early nineteen seventies. I do have a memory of how you would put the paper on your knee, have to hit it, fold it, fold it again, and then put a rubber band around it, put it in the basket on your bicycle. So. I don't remember what I got paid for that. I, I know what I got paid for selling peanuts at the baseball games. That I can remember. <laughs> George. Uh, I work training monkeys. Uh, <laughs> is a, uh, uh, so, so for me, as, as many, I, I happened to end up at a school that had a really strong finance faculty, was really um, inspired by, touched by great teachers, and, and decided you know that, uh, frankly, through their influence became uh, a real interest and then had the privilege at uh, uh, working for Goldman Sachs for uh, for many years and the opportunity to work with great folks in a both a collaborative and a competitive environment uh, was a was a special one great thank you okay now we move on to the 
to the very serious questions. Howard, starting with you and, and Oak Tree, and this is a topic that you've actually spoken about quite a lot, which is clearly money managers make their money from insights, um, information asymmetry. Now, as we look at a world of data 24 by 7, being able to analyze that data very quickly in a world of generative AI, at Oak Tree, how do you how do you manage this challenge of keeping on top of data and making decisions that other people don't have access to? Um, you know, uh, my son and I spent a lot of time uh, living together during the pandemic and exchanging views. And he's a venture capitalist, and uh, we distilled it in a memo I wrote in January of 21 called "Something of Value" because it was of great value. Uh, to live with him that period, but also uh, most of what we talked about was value investing. Um, and uh, his conclusion, which he uh, shared with me, which I accept, is that readily available quantitative information about the present cannot hold the secret to superior results because everybody has it. Yeah. And it, it, so if, if you start with that, I mean, it's a, it's a necessary thing to have and digest that information, but it's not sufficient to produce outperformance. And if you want to outperform as a, 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 in, in consequence, then, what you, then you, what you have to do is you either have to be better than others at understanding the long-term significance of the data, or you have to be better than others at uh, understanding the qualitative uh, 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 information about what you're dealing with. Uh, maybe, you know, I put, I put a lot of stress on behavioral aspects, which of course you can't read on a financial statement. Or you have to be better at, at intuiting the future, one of those three. But, you know, m everybody in our business is smart and numerate and computerized. And so merely the manipulation of short-term uh, quantitative information can't hold the key. Uh, so uh, you have to get beyond the data to understand not what it said, but what it means. So during the, the, the COVID era where we had, you know, numerous lockdowns, how did you, how did you maintain that edge um, when clearly data is not the only thing that, that you use? Well, at this point in my life, I'm not analyzing individual companies, but just read and, and, and read, uh, be exposed to the media, talk to people, uh, uh, understand it, what's uh, generally going on, and and you can get a sense for whether markets are uh, precarious or uh, propitious. Uh, that's all. All you can do uh, is, is, in my opinion, is get a sense. So Ming, when we were talking earlier, we, we talked about your China business and how you're using leveraging technology and data to see what's going on on the ground with your with your logistics operation there. Can you tell us a bit more around how you're using technology and data today and how you see that evolving over the next few years? So, <clears throat> you know, for, for us, um, we invest in uh, projects that, you know, need to anticipate what, be, what, what, what the world will be like in 20, 30 years. Because once you build a physical building, you can't tear it down five years uh, later. So we have to anticipate how technology evolve and the location and also the, uh, the specification, how to accommodate uh, automation and robotics. But more importantly is how does the retail pattern changes with technology? For, for instance, it went from mom and pop stores to chain stores to e-commerce to social retail. And then we probably eventually get into virtual, you know, real world retail. So all these things, all these patterns, how does that change on consumption behaviors and patterns and locations? and efficiencies. So these are things that we have to think about. Uh, and what we do is we uh, use our private equity arm to invest in kind of what's around the corner. So to give you an example, there's one portfolio company we invest in that has sensors on 40% of all trucks in China that are running. So during the uh, COVID lockdown, the central government couldn't get data from the local regional government and they don't trust the data. So they asked this company to provide them real-time trucking activity on the, on the ground. Because if you just take away the service sector, the trucking represents the real economy. So the, uh, they actually got a thank you letter from the Reform Commission uh, from Central Government 
for them to uh, react because they need to have policies to react to what's uh, what's uh, cities shut down, what's role is shut down, and uh, word of food are not being delivered and, and the necessary. So anyway, we use this data to make um, heat map and picking locations, but also understand this particular location, what's the value to that customer. So I'll give an example, if, uh, if this location is used by, let's say, Walmart to fulfill uh, just the empty stores at night, transportation cost for them is nothing because they're only making few trucks. But if this location is used by an express company or an uh, e-commerce company making thousands of trips, transportation cost is 60% of the operation. So where rent is only 20%. But for a Walmart operation, rent is 60% and transportation only 20%. I can take this location and give it to a frequent uh, delivery cu customer, increase the rent by 20% and they don't feel it. But if I push the rent 5% on Walmart, they experience it you know, because of a much lower base. So again, this is a simple example of technology. And we actually use that for, collect, uh, for uh, account receivable as well. If we see the activity uh, of that customer going down, we know it before the CFO, they don't, they don't, they're not doing well. <laughs> we actually replace those tenants early on. So that's why we're able to, over the last three years, despite the economy not doing that great, our account receivable went from 30 days to 12 days uh, today. So again, we're constantly turning and using this tech, uh, information to you know, stay ahead. And out of interest, where some of the macro um, headlines coming out of China look uh, challenging, what is, the, what is the trucking data telling us? So, um, you know, COVID hit in um, 2000. So 2019 um, was, uh, was normal. And then we, what we saw based on truck data is that uh, 2000 went down below 2019, but 2021 in China was normal. It actually, up till now, it's still the peak in 2021. Uh, 2022, still haven't got up to 2021 yet. But interestingly, 2023 numbers starting in August past 2022 by 4%. So, you know, uh, you, if you combine with energy consumption in China, that's about 4.5% increase. On top of that, you're seeing service sector consumption actually increasing a little bit. I guess the 5% GDP growth seems, seems real. Are the 23 numbers ahead of the same months in, in uh, 21? Uh, no. So we still haven't got back to 2021. But the 2023 numbers are above 2022 and above 2019 pre-COVID. Yeah. Well, very interesting. Thanks, thanks, Ming. So, Michael, uh, shifting gears slightly, you know, um, Howard Ming talked about technology data. Let's talk about a topic that, that Ken and David Rubenstein touched on yesterday, which is talent. Right, so in this world of, you know, everyone's super bright, everyone's got access to lots, lots of information, everyone speaks three languages, and is a computer scientist and an influencer. Um, as you think about hiring at Grosvenor, uh, what kind of people are you looking for? And in this era of whereby we're trying to hire for diversity of thought, right? How are you widening that funnel to get the best talent? Okay, so a, few, a couple of questions in, inside of that. Uh, first, just with regard to uh, DEI, I, I think it's clear to. Uh, most uh, business leaders now that uh, diverse teams uh, make better decisions. You have better ability to relate to your, your, your customers. You have better ability to relate to your opportunities, better ability to see your risks. So you want a diverse team, and I think part of the way that you get that is through intentionality. And you have to actually be intentional, and you have to work towards that and build that. That's been a constant effort for us for uh, for a long time, and we have uh, very good results uh, to show for that in an industry that does not have a, a, a tremendous amount of uh, diversity in the in the workforce. I, I think, in terms of the talent that you're looking for, and you know how you think about sort of the evolution of talent in your organization. First, a, as leaders, you spend more and more and more time over the years on talent. We are at the you know, end of the day, very much people, businesses, these are the assets of our firm, uh, and it's critical to uh, nurture, uh, find and nurture and, and develop uh, talent. So you spend more and more of your time doing that as, 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 you, as you grow over time. I sort of think about things in a couple, at a couple of different points. One, you know, can 
people do the work, and that relates to some of the core capabilities and skills that you talk about. So can they do the work? And, and that's kind of the first hurdle or speed bump or what have you uh, that people encounter. Then the next one is how's, how's their judgment and their execution and their decision making, which is different from doing the work. And you have people that can do the work really, really well, but they, they don't necessarily uh, you know, get, get to that next spot where they're actually, their, their judgment's fantastic or they're making uh, decisions. And then the, the last piece I would mention is something that may be interesting to the group here. A, 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 lot, a number of us came into the industry before it was really institutionalized. And a lot of the people that you had speak yesterday uh, you know, came into the industry before it was institutionalized. The institutionalization and the growth, at that, at that time, everybody had to do everything, you know. You were the proverbial chief cook uh, bottle washer. You were an investment person. You were a capital formation person. You were an operations and a regulatory person. You just had to do everything. And as the businesses have become institutionalized, people get slotted into specific roles, and they don't necessarily develop the skill sets outside of those silos. And we believe that for the good of our firm, and importantly for the good of our people, you really do want to have your investment people not just put capital to work, but also participate in capital raises and learn how to form, uh, you know, be cap competent with regard to capital formation and, and client relations. And if you're a young person, you want to do that for the, you know, the future of your career, that's important. So institutionalization has brought some challenges with regard to developing complete kind of entrepreneurs who can lead business lines and grow businesses over time. And it's something I think you have to be conscious of and again, manage with intentionality. Thank you. So, so George, we've hired the people. How do we then pay them? And in a, in a world once again where it's hard to make money, how do you pay your, your, you know, your portfolio managers to make money in a differentiated way? And at the end of the year, do you look at process? Do you look at performance? What are the considerations that go into that, that decision every year end? Happy to share how we do it. I think probably lots of folks in the room have lots of different models. Um, our, our model is, is grounded, um, our, our business is overwhelmingly an institutional business. Uh, so the, the clients are picking that particular team and, 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 and investigating them and underwriting them. They're not just saying, you know, Newberger Berman's a nice firm, let's, let's just send them money. It's, it's really grounded in, in, in the individual team. So I as much as we can, we try and uh, uh, frame the compensation around alignment with, uh, uh, with the client. And so, in, in frankly, firms that we look at and admire, um, many of whom are much smaller firms, and so we look at how would folks be compensated if it was a purely uh, performance-focused partnership delivering for that client. So overwhelmingly, ours is, is primarily uh, formulaic, linked to, link to, um, link to clients. If clients give them more money, our people get paid more. If clients take away money, they get, they get paid less. And then we, uh, we operate in a range uh, around that sort of baseline, uh, half of which is driven by performance, and we look first at three-year numbers, and then at five, and then at one. Uh, and then half of which is driven by um, uh, sort of citizenship. Are they, are they, uh, are they uh, a pleasure to work with and good teammates? But also is we have important firm initiatives. So uh, for a number of years, uh, real focus on ESG and on engagement. Not just are you driving great returns, but we believe that owners in the equity business, for example, shareholders need to behave like owners. Are you engaging with company management teams? Are you writing letters? Are you writing letters to the board? Are you, you know, can you demonstrate that you're, tr you're being a, a, a good steward? More recently, it was a huge focus on data science and, and rewarding those teams who are leaders there uh, in uh, sending a message to, to those teams who are not. Now it'll be probably more focused on embracing AI uh, and, and trying to, to help really what we're trying to do is to send a message that this is important and it will influence, but at the end of the day, uh, the core of compensation is driven by uh, client's decision, you know, is this the team I most want in the world to manage this particular asset uh, for us? 
And, and out of interest, are clients becoming more and more vocal about this topic in a world of higher rates, and therefore that additional alpha that they want you to generate suddenly you know, becomes much more emphasized? Um, I don't think so. I mean, clients have always been, uh, been difficult and challenging, and uh, it's, a, you know, it's a wildly competitive world and, and always, always has been. So I, I think uh, you know, ours is a fiercely, fiercely, fiercely competitive business, and, and clients are demanding, but I, I think clients, at least from my seat, always have been, uh, always have been demanding and engaged. Howard, would you agree with that at Oak Tree? Well, um, we're like George in the sense that we're not asset allocators for the most part. We, we get hired to play a role. And, uh, uh, you know, our clients, of course, they want good performance, but they also want interaction. And they want to uh, know our thoughts and they want us to help contribute to their decisions. So I think that, that, uh, that client interaction is extremely important and uh, sometimes much more important than whether you were up 10 last year or 9. Okay, interesting. So, so Michael, um, George touched on the, the, uh, the important acronym ESG. It's an asset class that you said previously uh, will become ubiquitous. Every high quality portfolio should have some, et cetera, et cetera. In a world whereby the topic, particularly in the US, is becoming increasingly politicized, energy security considerations play a big role, particularly in this part of the world. And then when we look at ESG fund performance over the last uh, year or two, it's underperformed the rest of the market. So with that backdrop, how do you still feel about, you know, ESG becoming ubiquitous and how do you think about it in your portfolio construction? So I, I do think, uh, I, I continue to believe that. I think it will become ubiquitous. Mark Rowan had a line yesterday and, and I should just, I, I, need, uh, I need to pause and thank HKMA May for having us here and Eddie, thank you. Uh, I, I, I forgot to do that earlier, but Mark, yesterday was a great day and there was a lot of uh, conversation that, was, uh, that I found interesting and I found valuable being here. Mark's line yesterday I think was like, you know, energy transition is gonna, I, I didn't quite per perfectly get the analogy, but it was any energy transition is gonna, you know, consume more capital uh, than the discovery of fire or something like that. And um, I, I agree that um, ESG will be ubiquitous and what I, meant by that at the time was I think there will be a day and for some firms, some very good firms that have presented here, it, to that day had, came two years ago where when they make an investment, they have a plan for the asset they acquire that reduces emissions over a period of time. And there are terrific firms that had their leaders up here yesterday that have been doing that for years already. And every investment is accompanied by a plan. I think there will be a day when private equity does not buy a business without that business having a plan to bring emissions down by a certain amount over a certain period of time. I think the investors in these firms will want that more than those who don't. I'll come to that in a minute. And um, I think the returns will prove that. So $76 billion of capital that we manage 25 billion is ESG and, or impact. That's not all energy. That's not all carbon. Uh, we're the largest investor with uh, women uh, and diverse alternative asset managers, I think, in the world. Uh, and, and that's part of our, our ESG capital. But I, I think that this will just become something we all do for return. And our 25 billion has grown not only because clients have wanted that, but because that's where our investment teams have deployed the capital. Regardless of the mandate, that's where they've felt the, the returns are. It was pretty amazing two years ago when the war in Ukraine started to see this very fast and very powerful pushback on carbon in the United States. You had uh, 18 state attorneys general sign a letter that you know their states weren't gonna uh, they were gonna sort of you know look for people that were trying driving esg boy, boycotting uh fossil fuels and you know try to uh, circle them and cut them off from the capital 
uh, of their states. You had a couple of states pass, pass laws. It became very politicized. It definitely slowed things down a bit. Doesn't change my view of where we're going. And I actually think there's a lot of leadership coming from right here in Hong Kong and greater China to drive ESG. And I think that's very important for where we're going uh, globally. With this political backlash, I, I would just share that for many, many years, we've operated portfolios in the diverse manager space. The states in the US have had very different constitutional approaches to that space. So you've had states where that is not allowed to be a factor for consideration, and states where there was an affirmative mandate to engage with women or minority-owned firms. And so I think whatever the political noise is, and some of it is, you know, it's, there's a lot of headlines there, there's some cheap opportunities for, you know, politicians, et cetera, but whatever that political noise is, I think we're going in one direction. I think it's a positive, constructive direction, and it's gonna be a lot bigger part of all of our portfolios, whether we do that by mandate or simply based on opportunity. And how are those portfolios performing without sharing any state secrets? Uh, uh, so our, our, you know, our ESG and impact portfolios generally are performing, uh, have performed quite well. Uh, again, for us, it's ESG and impact, and it's a number of different strategies. Our diverse manager portfolio has tremendous performance uh, in the private equity space, as an example, over a, you know, 17-year period of time. Thanks, Michael. So, Howard, um, I watched your interview yesterday with, uh, with Bloomberg, and you said, now's the time for credit. I think that's the view that you've been sharing for the last um, year or so in a, in a higher rate environment. How do you feel about, well, clearly you believe that, you believe that, but in a world whereby we have higher for longer and potentially increasing signals of a recession, how do the two, how do you uh, square that circle? Well, first of all, I don't think this is the time to invest in credit. This is a time to invest in credit. And, um, uh, the, the, you know, uh, on my annual trip to Asia, which was a year ago now, uh, I fin put the finishing touches on a memo called Sea Change. And I think that we uh, are undergoing and have undergone a sea change. Um, and, you know, anybody who uh, came into this business since 1980 has only seen declining interest rates and ultra low interest rates. Uh, you have to go back to the 70s to have had a different experience, which most people don't do. Um, but I think, and, and, and declining interest rates are great for asset values and they're great for reducing the cost of capital. So by definition, they're great for people who buy assets with borrowed money. And we have now have a lot of popular asset strategies which consist of buying assets with borrowed money. And they did well in the declining uh, interest rate environment. You would have to have something wrong with you not to do well uh, in, in, with a levered portfolio in a period of declining interest rates. Uh, but my essential message is that that's over. And, you know, from the current levels, uh, one of these days when we declare uh, victory against inflation, the, in, the Fed funds rate will come down a little but it's not going to come down another 2,000 basis points like it did in the last 40 years, and it's not going to uh, be at um, half a percent, which was the average from 09 through 21. So if you accept that, that the period of declining and, interest and, uh, and ultra low interest rates are over, then the strategies that did best in that environment are ne necessarily the strategies that will do best now. The key is today you can get equity returns from credit. And that changes a lot, you know. Uh, 21 months ago, high-yield bonds yielded four, and today they yield over nine. The four was not very useful. The nine plus is quite useful for my clients. It changes everything. And, and uh, that nine is the lowest aspiring of all our strategies. If you go into uh, private credit and lock up your money for some period of years, then you get into the double digits uh, and so forth. So I think this is, a, you know, we went through a difficult period. I gave a speech for eight years entitled uh, investing in a low return world because that's what it was for, for credit or debt investors. 
but it's not a low return world anymore, and I'm very excited about that, and I think that credit, by definition, should have a bigger allocation in portfolios than it did in that period. And Howard, for an individual, you've seen many cycles. Um, do you think a recession is looming? Uh, a recession is always looming, depending on your definition of looming. There's, <laughs> okay, there, I mean, there's always a recession ahead. How about a uh, one-year time but, horizon? Well, uh, you know, um, John Maynard Keynes said we have two kinds of forecasters, the ones who don't know and the ones who don't know they don't know. And I am solidly in the first group. Uh, one of our, uh, one of the tenets of our investment philosophy at Oak Tree is that we don't, our investment driven decisions are not driven by macro forecasts. So uh, I don't know, and uh, I would, it would be nice if I could know, but since I can't know, then I, I don't care about it. And we, we, you know, we try to invest uh, conservatively in high quality companies that will endure. Um, and if we get that right, then it doesn't matter what kind of economic fluctuations we go through in the short run. Uh, the, the, the emphasis in our business on the short run is really excessive and, and in my opinion, immaterial. Okay, thank you, Howard. So Ming, shifting gears from, from credit to your world, logistics, uh, data centers, renewables, you're in 17 markets. Um, which markets are you most excited about? And of those three segments, which segment are you most excited about? So, <laughs> yeah, we're in 11, or, okay, 17 countries, but basically a few, few major regions, because there's so many countries in Europe. Um, I would say we started in logistic, and we're leveraging um, the knowledge in logistic warehousing to, you know, help our customers expand to data center, and then leveraging our roof again to solar. And those three uh, sequence, the largest still being logistic, the, uh, and the second largest is data center, and then renewable energy. I would say if you give it long enough time, the size of AVM probably reverse over time, just because of the addressable market size. Um, Japan has been our most profitable market um, for the last 10 years. Uh, it's amazing, even last 10 years economy, we are still getting 40 to 50% IRR on our development program in Japan. It's, um, um, you know, people say, has in Japan been a, a st you know, a low, uh, low growth? Every business is about supply and demand, and it's been uh, limited supply, and the, the demand side has been strong in our sector. So, from a, unfortunately, the market in Japan is not only so so big, so we can't place out as much capital as as we want to. And I would say U.S. market has been uh, very strong for us. And I would say now, I actually, I think China, everyone, everyone's been so negative. Actually, I think it's oversold. Um, I actually like it when someone, I like it when everyone doesn't like something. <laughs> uh, and um, so I always believe that there's a value for everything. If gold is good, but if you tell me $10,000 per ounce, it's not good. You know, uh, on us, opposite of gold, there's a value and there's a price. So I always uh, say, you know, we, we always talk about risk. There's no such thing as high risk or low risk. Is are you getting paid for the risk? Uh, so from that standpoint, I'm actually um, I'm probably more bullish on China uh, than 99% um, of people. Okay, thank you. So George, um, a topic that was discussed yesterday in both camps were called risky, which is public and private investing. Newberger is one of those unique um, companies whereby you've got you know material portfolios in both camps. Uh, what was, how did you make that decision given most companies are basically are either in one camp or another? And um, do you see the public and the private markets um, converging at some point? So we always looked at it as, as simply investing. And, and so what, uh, and, and I think the, the world is coming around this way and many, many of the folks in the room are, public firms are racing to build private capabilities, build or, or uh, or, or acquire, and we've found great value in terms of having both. I think is um, for private market investors, understanding the public markets have never been more critical. Um, and many of the skill sets we have in our public market teams, for example, in credit, has been incredibly helpful to our development of uh, in the private credit market. 
in, are seeing also more and more sort of institutional mandates that are these large, you know, crossover mandates used to be adding high yield to a high grade portfolio and, and now is uh, in, instead means, you know, you, you, you decide where it goes across public and, and, and private markets. So it's, uh, it's a core part of what we do. We have not, uh, we haven't struggled to, to have the, you know, the disparate teams and frankly, I think the opportunities to collaborate uh, are very valuable. I also think, you know, investments that we make in things like data science and AI, um, many of which are driven from our public market investing, I think are gonna be really differentiating in the, the, the private space uh, as well. So I think these worlds are colliding and that many of the firms today that, that aren't in both uh, will be a decade, a decade from now. So Michael, I saw you nodding as Ming was talking about, you know, looking at asset classes, sectors, geographies that others may not like. Yeah. Um, is, there, is there a particular sweet spot that you're looking at that others may not like where you're spotting opportunity? Uh, I, I think that our approach is typically to be pretty broadly diversified across, uh, you know, a number of strategies. And so I, I'm not sure that we think there's a you know, a, a, a unique um, under, you know, overlooked opportunity that the crowd here over the last couple of days isn't familiar with. I think to uh, Howard's, uh, Howard's comments, uh, we, we've been increasing our allocations to credit. We've been al increasing our allocations to uh, credit broadly defined. Uh, it, it George just mentioned we've been raising capital that is credit focused, but it has a broad mandate. You can go where you want in the credit markets with uh, with that capital, and we think that uh, there's a, a better opportunity in, 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 uh, to be doing that today than there was two years ago, obviously, and it's a, probably the first time you know, in, in a while that we've been able to be excited about the absolute level of return uh, that is coming from kind of credit-like risk, and that feels very good to us. So we're, uh, I don't think that's uh, novel, and I don't think it's anything that's that's overlooked, but uh, nonetheless, I think it's uh, uh, smart to do. And in general, everything we do is in the alternative investment space, both private markets, whether it's infrastructure, real estate, private equity, uh, or in the liquid alternatives or hedge fund space, and, and diversified portfolio inside that universe has made a lot of sense to me for a long period of time, and it continues to make a lot of sense to me uh, in, today's, uh, in today's environment. Great, which then nicely brings me on to my last questions because I'm conscious that we're running out of time. So gentlemen, put yourself in my shoes. I just turned 50 earlier this year. Um, I've accumulated a savings pot, not from the, the paper round that I used to do. Um, if I look forward 10 years and I'll have a 10 years savings horizon, uh, what should I put my money in? Howard. Well, of course, there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all answer, and it depends on your aspirations and your risk tolerance. Um, but uh, I've got I've got a five-year-old, so I've got some school fees to pay. Okay, school fees to pay. Well, you know what? Uh, obviously, uh, I think that you can get very good returns with a high degree of certainty in credit. Um, the bedrock for every portfolio should always be equities. You know, in, in the long run, you, you want to invest in the growth of the w global economy and the performance of, of uh, leading global corporations. And, and so you, you should never get away with that, get away from that. Okay, thank you, Howard. Ming, your advice for me? You should let me manage it. <laughs> your management fees are too high. No, um, you know, we focus on investing in um, infrastructure for a new economy that things, you know, that last 20, 30 years, because I always say, I am not smart enough to compete with everyone on the latest trend. So I'm focusing on investing in things that won't change the next 20, 30 years. So regardless, as long as there's population, there's consumption, and you know, that is gonna be driven by AI, there's AI everything, and then energy is transition. So these are the things that uh, to 20, 30 years won't change. So I'm betting on these uh, you know, for the next 20, 30 years. Great, thanks, Ming. Michael? I, I think f uh, for most investors, prudence, means that um, asset allocation needs to take uh, precedent over security selection, and you need to have a degree of diversification in your portfolio 
uh, for you to, you know, sleep at night and, and uh, not make the wrong decision uh, at, the, at, the, at the wrong time. And uh, so from my perspective, you'd be diversifying across strategies. You'd certainly have long, you know, strategies that had residual long equity. I do think private equity, despite higher interest rates, will continue to outperform uh, over time, over a long period of time, uh, liquid equities, you maybe get some more uh, adjustment in, in pricing. But once that market starts to open up and roll uh, forward again, you're going to get good returns there, as you always have. Uh, infrastructure, uh, in particular, kind of new infrastructure, uh, has uh, a, you know, a lot of tremendous opportunity. And so to me, a diversified portfolio of the alternative strategies. If you're going to go get on a boat and sail around for five years and not want to worry about anything and not worry about checking on it, that's a great way to go. Fabulous. Thank you. George? Uh, I w would say my, my favorite trade or theme would be uh, being a liquidity provider to private equity firms right now. It uh, can be the secondary market, can be uh, midlife deals and GP-led secondaries, can be co-investing, can be uh, uh, putting in preferreds into uh, private equity uh, deals that perhaps didn't do a great job of hedging interest rate uh, exposure. So I think, there, I think there are a whole series of different things around that theme that uh, uh, are, are just particularly attractive right now. Uh, so I put some in that, and then I put the bulk in a, uh, uh, you know, diversification notwithstanding, uh, in a high-quality portfolio of small and mid-cap companies um, that are profitable, have low leverage, and solid market positions, sort of steady eddies. Um, which uh, have, are, are sort of unloved right now, and I think uh, have a good good shot at uh, delivering a, a solid a solid diversified return over a 10-year period. Great. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for the sage advice. I'll be sure to speak to my J.P. Morgan private banker. Um, so, with that, thank you very much for your time, um, audience. Hope you enjoyed the conversation, and um, enjoy the rest of the conference.